So I'll turn it over to Ryan X. Charles. Ryan fares from a number of blockchain organizations. He's currently working with Bitco. And special thanks to, thanks to Bitco for, uh, and for you, Ryan. So take it away. All right, all right. Thank you very much. Very happy to be here. So I, I taught at the first one, and uh, that is the first blockchain university, I guess it was about three months ago. Um, so I'm covering similar stuff that I covered in the last one, but I've, I've learned from the presentation I gave, because there were a whole bunch of questions and stuff that people asked. So I sort of answered the questions inside the presentation, so we'll see uh, what, uh, what new questions we get today. Um, so first of all, like, who am I? Uh, so I, I was a physicist. Um, as Yvonne is uh, aware, uh, also a physicist. Um, so I was a, getting a PhD in physics, and I was actually in grad school for about six years total. And in my last two years, starting in early 2011, I discovered Bitcoin, and I was just really blown away with the technology, and I thought it was, had enormous potential. And in early 2011, the community was a lot smaller than it is today. I mean, I think it's still fairly small, but it was very, very, very small in early 2011. Um, so I just sort of uh, treated Bitcoin like a hobby. I was very interested in participating in the forums and stuff. I didn't program anything for Bitcoin back then. Um, but basically Bitcoin kept growing for the next two or so years. Um, and I continued to get my, my physics PhD thinking I would be a professor. Uh, but Bitcoin got big enough in early 2013 that I decided, well, this is just a wonderful opportunity that I'd be missing if I stayed in physics. And physics, for people who are or aren't aware, uh, I don't think academia is, well, it wasn't the right career for me. So I was sort of looking for what is a, a better opportunity for myself, and Bitcoin just came along at, at, a, at the right time. So I decided to leave my PhD and go full-time Bitcoin. So that was almost two years ago. Um, and I consciously set about to master JavaScript because I had a lot of experience with software engineering in general, but I wanted to figure out you know, what is the best way for me to contribute to this space. Um, I chose JavaScript because it's on the most like, platforms. It's the best way to reach the most people. So I consciously decided I'm going to focus my effort on mastering JavaScript Bitcoin. Um, so I, uh, shortly thereafter, I went. So I had actually quit my PhD without knowing what I was going to do. Uh, and I shortly thereafter joined BitPay and had a wonderful time at BitPay for uh, a year working on BitPay's open source projects. Um, so that's kind of a long story. Uh, then another kind of long story is how I left BitPay and joined Reddit for a little while and was the cryptocurrency engineer at Reddit. Um, so I worked on a project there called Reddit Notes, which is officially still going to happen, but it's probably delayed for a while while well, Reddit works out the, uh, the legal challenges around that, what that project would have been. So now I'm very happy to be at BitGo, uh, where I keep, I keep doing basically the same stuff I've been doing, which is JavaScript Bitcoin, um, and with an emphasis on Bitcoin security, because I think it's really important to solve the real basic problems before solving the more advanced problems. So Bitcoin security is, I consider, a really basic problem that's very important, and it's not quite solved yet, and that's the problem we're trying to solve at BitGo. Um, so, and in the course of all this, I've implemented most of the Bitcoin protocol. I've not quite implemented everything, but I've implemented a lot of things. One day I will be able to say I've implemented everything, but not quite yet. Uh, as of today, I've implemented most of the Bitcoin protocol. Uh, so you can see me on GitHub. It's github.com slash ryanxcharles, and I'm also pretty active on Twitter, twitter.com slash ryanxcharles. So today I'm at BitGo, uh, very happy to be here. Um, so BitGo is a two of three multi-sig wallet and platform. So if you're a developer, you can use our multi-sig platform to say, uh, basically take care of the security for your Bitcoins. If you're running some type of Bitcoin business, you can rely on us to sort of write the software for you. And we don't hold your money, we just have one of the keys in a two of three multi-sig wallet. Uh, and we also have a very user-friendly uh, wallet which most people aren't aware of, but we recently made our uh, enterprise um, wallet available to everyone for free. So anybody can use BitGo today and get all the full enterprise features for free. And of course, that's at bitgo.com and github.com slash bitgo. So uh, the outline for today is, um, 
I, I think originally I was going to talk about mining. That was part of my talk last time, and then I basically have pushed mining out because there's not enough time. And people ask questions about scripts. So instead of, I, I'm still talking about mining a little bit towards the end, but not very much. And I've inserted some information about scripts. So I'm talking about, you know, what is a transaction, what are the scripts that are inside of a transaction, and what are blocks which hold transactions. And uh, I also have some, some code, code samples uh, that I worked out for you guys so you guys can see some of the stuff actually working. So this is a really great chart of the structure of a transaction. This chart was created by Alan Rayner. It's on the Bitcoin wiki for those of you who have a computer with you. It's, it's uh, a really, really great chart. Um, if you just sort of sit here and stare at this chart and try to understand what all the details are, you'll have a pretty good understanding of where a transaction is. And in a nutshell, transactions have inputs and outputs. The inputs point to previous transaction outputs, and that's it. That's what a transaction is. The transactions are all linked to each other until you go sort of find the, uh, the Coinbase transaction where those Bitcoins come from. So we're going to talk about all the details of all this stuff. This, this is like the, the lessons that I've learned writing Bitcoin wallets and Bitcoin services and stuff where you have to deal with what a Bitcoin transaction is. So some of this is a little bit boring. The stuff at, at the start will be kind of boring, but it's stuff that you have to know or the rest of the stuff won't make sense. So uh, that's the number formats part. So we'll talk about that first. Then we'll talk about scripts. Uh, and there's going to be sort of two sections on scripts. So I'll talk about what a script is, but then later we'll also talk about what a script interpreter is and how the scripts are actually run and stuff like that. And uh, uh, transactions have, so transaction inputs and transaction outputs. And so we'll talk about sort of everything that's in uh, these things. So first of all, number formats. So which number format does Bitcoin use? This is just about every number format I've ever heard of on this, on this list here. So it's a trick question because the answer is Bitcoin uses all of them. It uses just for weird reasons, it uses a whole bunch of different number formats. So big Indian, little Indian, it uses floating points and you know integers, uh, signed and unsigned. There are two different ways to represent the sign. And um, there's also variable size. There are actually two different variable size numbers. So uh, just roughly speaking, how many people know the difference between big Indian and little Indian numbers, just so I have an idea? Okay, so some people, um, uh, but not everyone. So this is something that if you start dealing with byte level stuff, like byte level network protocols and stuff like that, the Indianness of numbers really matters. So big Indian is sort of the way you would normally write down a number if you were to write it down on paper. You would write down the most significant digit first. It feels very natural to do it that way because we're all trying to do it that way. But there's also Little Indian, which is the reverse. And there's no logical reason why we should necessarily prefer one over the other. And for whatever reason, a lot of microprocessors, particularly x86, actually represent numbers in Little Indian. I guess it's, they found it to be more efficient at least some time ago. And so uh, if you deal with this stuff, you have to be aware of, you know, does my protocol do Big Indian? Do I have to convert to Little Indian when we do operations on it? So these are just some examples of the difference between a big Indian and a little Indian number. Uh, write in a number 1,000 in, in, uh, in decibel and then see the same number in hex. So this shorter, sort of shows you the, the notation I'm going to use for the rest of this presentation. So hex just means like a normal you know, uh, base 16 number. Uh, then decimal bytes are like the, you know, writing down the byte number as a decimal number. And then hex bytes, of course, is hex but with sort of an extra zero at the start if it's, you know, it has to come in pairs. Uh, and then binary bytes are just sort of the, the binary representation. Um, so here are just some more examples. So if you think about what does little india mean, rather than saying the word 1001, it would be like saying one in 1000. So it's sort of reverse and weird. Um, so the next thing that matters is sign. So there are two ways to represent numbers in Bitcoin. Um, one is uh, sign magnitude. So this is where you just use the most significant bit to represent the sign. So a positive number would have a zero uh, first bit, and then a negative number has a one first bit. The two's complement is the same for positive numbers, and then officially it's defined as something like the number minus two to the n, or something like that is, is the official definition. And positive numbers are all the same, but uh, negative numbers are like off by this weird factor of one, so everything ends up, you know, looking like a completely different number. So that's why negative one looks like all ones in, in two's complement. 
Um, and then one thing to sort of note is that I have, uh, uh, you'll see things like um, FF and 80 in hex a lot. FF means all ones in binary, and then 80 means it starts with one. So we'll see that type of thing show up a few times. So here's just another example. This was in Big India, and this is in Little India, and so like in the sign magnitude one at the bottom. In Little India, the most significant bit becomes, well, the most significant bit of the most significant byte, but the most significant byte is at the end. So, yeah. <clears throat> so here are just some more examples of converting a number. So I just sort of programmed these to, to have some, uh, to show you guys so you can see uh, what it looks like in different formats. So, you know, the number five, this is a little Indian, so number five, most significant, um, I feel like that's, yeah, that's, that's correct. Most significant is at the left, or sorry, least significant is at the left, but it's only five, so that's why you see five at the left there. Um, oops. Um, sign magnitude, uh, it's the exact same because you know, sign bit is zero. Um, trees complement starts to look really funny because it's negative and you just track through the end and so you like it's all ones and stuff. So those are just some, some simple examples to refer to. Um, so here's uh, yet another format, a number format using Bitcoin. So in Bitcoin, of course, it's, it's a, I guess there are a few ways size matters. Size matters in the size of the data that you're transmitting over the network. It also really matters in the size of the data stored permanently in the blockchain. So Satoshi invented a custom variable size format that's called compact size in the source code. Uh, and I call it varint just because it's simpler. Um, and uh, the idea of this is that, um, so you could always use, say, four bytes to represent a number. Then you're limited in the maximum size of the number that can be represented in four bytes. And also, if you're mostly representing small numbers and only rarely re representing large numbers, um, you're sort of wasting space. So here's this example of the number one. If you're always representing one, two, and only very infrequently some giant number, you're always wasting these three zeros uh, bytes of, uh, of space. Um, so compact size is at least one byte and nine bytes at most. And what this looks like is you start with a header byte, um, which for 0 to 253 is just the number. But if you get one of these other higher uh, uh, header bytes, then it tells you, you know, how much more data to expect in this variable size integer. So uh, if it's 254, it's you expect a two byte little Indian unsigned in integer to follow, uh, 255, uh, 4 bytes, 256, 8 bytes. So here are some examples of this. So the number 0 is represented with just a single byte, number 1 is represented with a single byte. Uh, and as you start to get to bigger and bigger numbers, you have to use more bytes to store this number. Uh, and then there are a couple of interesting properties of this, which is that there are degeneracies which is the number zero has more than one way to represent it. So this is something you have to be aware of if you need like byte for byte equivalence between two transactions or something. Be aware that variable size integers have like sort of multiple encodings. Um, and usually you want to pick the, the simplest one. So to represent the number zero, you use like a single zero byte. Another format is big integers. This is something just to sort of be aware of. So an integer could be any number of bytes, and, and the, the type that you'll experience if you program in C and C++ and any type of you know, low-level type of thing, you'll see one byte, two bytes, four bytes, eight bytes, but what about 32 bytes? You don't see 32 bytes built into microprocessors, but this is just for security reasons. We want to use large numbers in cryptography. Uh, so Bitcoin uses a 256-bit you know, numbers to represent private keys and stuff. Um, so we have to have a way, a notion within our software language to represent big integers. So normally this is like a library, like in C++ you have to use some type of library or something, it's just not built in. Python is built in, so if you're using Python it just sort of naturally supports big integers. JavaScript is not, which is my language of preference, so I have to use somebody's you know, big number uh, library to, to do big number math. Uh, and in Bitcoin, the big integers, uh, Sometimes they're big Indian, sometimes they're little Indian, so you have to be aware of all these possibilities. Sometimes they're signed, sometimes they're unsigned. Sometimes they're signed, but always assumed to be unsigned and weird, things like that. Um, and uh, so I've never, uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, big integers never occur as two's complement, so they're always uh, signed magnitude in Bitcoin, as far as I can remember or have noticed. 
Um, and here's just an example of, a, of an important number in Bitcoin. So n is the uh, order of the curve, which is, uh, it's basically like the largest uh, private key. So the numbers in the Bitcoin math wrap around, they're all modulus. So if you get a number that's bigger than this, you take the mod of it and you get a small number. So that's like the biggest big integer that occurs. And it starts with all Fs, meaning it's quite a large number. It's nearly the highest possible 256-bit number, but not quite the highest possible 256-bit number. So another uh, format is called script num. This occurs in the, uh, uh, in the script interpreter. So numbers that you sort of push to the stack, and we'll cover all this later, because this is exactly the thing people asked me about last time. Uh, when you push numbers to the stack, uh, they are typically uh, uh, variable size. They can be as little as one byte, as big as four bytes. Um, however, if you add two large numbers together, you might overflow and get, say, five bytes. So this is a weird custom uh, format used by Bitcoin where it represents these numbers as actually eight byte uh, numbers in C++, but uh, it treats anything that you try to perform an operation on that's over four bytes as being invalid. However, if you do add two four byte numbers together, you can get a five byte number. So it's just a weird custom format that's relevant for, uh, for scripts. Um, now, uh, fixed point numbers. So we'll talk about fixed point and floating point. Uh, fixed point is where you have like the decimal point in a fixed place. So if you want to represent you know, fractions, um, an obvious way to do it is to uh, you know, have some number of decimal points. But when you store it in you know, binary, where does the decimal place, you know, how do you represent the decimal place? So fixed point is basically moving the decimal place over some number of places. It's just sort of interpreting it as, as, a, as a smaller number. But the problem with fixed point is that you always have a fixed number of places. So if you need to write something that's either a much smaller number or something like that, you run out of detail. Um, so this is relevant to Bitcoin because we all so we write Bitcoin as uh, you know as a as a fixed point uh, uh, number. So it always has eight decimal places. It never has more. If it's more than eight decimal places, it's it's invalid. Um, and satoshis are always integers. Um, and one interesting fact is that if you're dealing with JavaScript, the the these numbers fit comfortably within uh, JavaScript's number type. So JavaScript only supports 32-bit numbers, 32-bit uh, uh, integers anyway, um, and this fits, or actually it supports like something like 53 bits or something like that. But anyway, this fits within it, so you can you can handle these numbers just fine without worrying about it in JavaScript. Um, and uh, yeah, okay, so one e minus nine is not a valid Bitcoin line. So now floating point, the difference between fixed point and floating point, that's exactly what it sounds like, the point, you know, there's not a fixed number of, of decimal places, so you write it in exponential form. Um, there's a standard for this called IEEE 754, which is what like everybody always uses built into microprocessors and stuff. So we do floating point math, that's what it uses. Um, so you often see this written as a string, so you might write it into your program as 6e minus 45. And if I'm not mistaken, the actual binary format is like 2 to the power of something rather than 10 to the power of something, because like, 6e minus 45 means 10 to the power of. So in binary, it's actually like 2 to the power of, or whatever, it translates it. Um, so here are just some examples. Again, some just random, I just typed in some random number and converted it to an 8 byte big Indian and an 8 byte little Indian floating point. So it just looks like gibberish. So you know, you have to, you probably would not immediately recognize what that number is without parsing it and converting it to a string or something. So, so that's it. So we've, we've basically covered everything. So I like to joke about Satoshi. If a Bitcoin format exists, Bitcoin uses it somewhere. Um, so this is just sort of a list of where they, roughly speaking, occur. So we'll cover all these now. So you'll see why I had to cover all this stuff, because they all are going to matter in all the details I'm going to give uh, uh, next. So we'll cover that. So now we've sort of transcended the really basic just numbers, and now we're going to start talking about some higher level things. So a public key is defined as uh, a private key times the base point of a curve. Um, so big P is public key, little p is private key. Um, so it's two numbers, it's x and y, it's a, it's a point. Um, if you plot 
uh, what the points look like in SCCP 256K1. It looks like this weird field of points. Um, and elliptic curve math is a big subject, but uh, in a nutshell, uh, it looks like randomness. Like if you multiply a, a private key times a public key, you could get any point anywhere in like two dimensional space almost. So it's, it's uh, you know, the public keys can be any two 256 bit numbers basically. Um, one interesting feature of public keys is that if you know whether y is odd or not, you can derive it from x. So you can represent public keys as either an x and a y, or as the fact that y is odd or not and just x. So this lets you save data. So here are the, this, these are, uh, this is DER format, which is used in Bitcoin pretty frequently, because uh, there's more than one thing you can encode in DER format, public keys one of them. So the compressed public key format, which you see in the blockchain, is, is the y format, or is the y odd or not, followed by the x value. So this would be 33 bytes, because it's a 32 byte, um, you know, x, 30, 32 plus the one, right? Uh, so 33. Um, uncompressed, which is also in the blockchain, but people don't really do this anymore just because uh, it's unnecessarily large, is just the number four followed by x and then followed by y. So this is like 32 bytes of wasted space. So don't do uncompressed public keys. I think almost, I, just recently, I believe Coinbase converted from, from, uh, from uncompressed to compressed. They were probably the last one. So. Everybody uses compressed just because it saves space in the blockchain. It's less to transmit over the network and everything. It's, it's purely better. Um, and it's just the header byte is whatever. It's, it's usually either two or three if it's, if it's a compressed public key. Um, so next signatures. This is another thing that occurs uh, in transactions. So a signature consists of R and S. And again, it's more elliptic curve math. There's an algorithm for computing a signature. It does some additions and some multiplications, and you get two numbers that are just called R and S. Um, so a compact signature would just be where you just write down what the values of R and S is. To me, this would be the obvious way to write down what a signature is. It's the X value and the Y value, one after the other. They're always 32 bytes. Just write down R and then S. Um, so that has a name and that in Bitcoin. It's called a compact signature. Um, and this is used in Bitcoin message signing. So there's a standard way to sign non-transaction data with Bitcoin, and that format uses uh, compact signatures. However, in the blockchain, um, whoops, in the blockchain, uh, we don't see compact signatures. We see this weird other complicated format called DER format. This is just what OpenSSL uses, or at least this is how we speculate that Satoshi decided to do it this way. This is just what OpenSSL does. So if you sign something and get like a binary uh, signature, it gives you a uh, DER format. So this is just sort of annoyingly complicated because it didn't need to be this complicated. Um, so it has a header byte, it has the length of like the whole thing, it has the length of the R value and it has the length of the S value. And the S values are in sign magnitude but they're never negative. So like if you ever have, like if it starts with like a one but it's a small enough number you have to add an extra zero byte at the start to clarify that it's not negative. So it's just a very, you know, uh, for Bitcoin anyway, it's sort of needlessly complicated, but this is just how it is. So you have to use the ER format in a transaction. This is just what format they're in. And there are a whole bunch of details that you have to worry about if you're really parsing this stuff. Like if you're parsing a transaction, you have to be exactly equally as loose as OpenSSL is, um, because you wouldn't want to accidentally, uh, you know, invalidate a signature and then therefore regard a transaction as being invalid if OpenSSL, which is what is used in Bitcoin, at least as of today, uh, uh, doesn't treat it as being invalid, because that would put you off in the corner, right? Somebody could give you money and you would think that you received it, or they could, you would think that you hadn't received it, or they could play any number of games. So you have to get all the details right, and unfortunately it's a little bit complicated, but that's how it is. Um, so next we see opcodes. So we'll have fun talking about how all these are used in the script interpreter, but they're basically just one byte values that represent an operation. Uh, and I can't, I'm not going to explain most of them. I mean, they're usually pretty obvious, and you can look at the Bitcoin source code, and it's it's pretty clear what they're doing. So things like dupe means duplicating. Uh, 
up there in the upper, upper right, to alt stack, from alt stack, there's a, uh, Bitcoin has two stacks, again, which we'll cover, but uh, you can move stuff from the stack to the alt stack. Um, it has if statements, it has, you know, I don't know, all, all sorts of other stuff. You can push just, you can push data, and this is just a small list. I would say it's probably, I don't know, three times bigger than this list. There are quite a few operations. Um, so a script consists of basically operations plus data that you're pushing to the stack. So that would be like, you know, if you're writing a program and you write, you know, a string into your program, that's basically what you're doing with the script. You write down the operations and then you have like data. So the operation might say, push the following six bytes to the stack, and then that operation is followed by six bytes of data that you want to push to the stack. So these are just some examples so you can see what, what a script looks like in hex. So I've converted op5, op5, op equal verify, just a random collection of, of, uh, of uh, uh, statements there. I mean, it would, it would evaluate the truth um, because, uh, <clears throat> you know, op, so I push, op, I push 5 to the stack, I push 5 to the stack again, and then what op equal verify does is, if they're equal, it pops both from the stack and returns true. Or I think it, yeah, it, it pops both to the stack and then I think, it, I think it actually doesn't push anything to the stack. So it just pops in from the stack if they're equal. If they're not equal, it like invalidates your script, it returns false. Here's another example, pushing some other data. So if you want to push large amounts of data, larger than just a few bytes, you have to use the, you know, like a, uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, these push data commands. So I'm saying push three bytes um, to the stack, followed by whatever three bytes. Um, so a transaction consists of inputs and outputs. So here, uh, here's what an input looks like. So an input is the hash of the transaction that you're inputting, plus the output number from that transaction, uh, plus basically a script, but the script can vary in size, so you represent the size with a variable size integer. So the variable size integer goes first, followed by the script, and then followed by the sequence number, which is not very widely used, but it exists. So, how long can a script then be? Uh, so, in I mean, it, in, it, in the protocol, there's a limit of like 500 bytes. So, uh, yeah, 500 bytes basically. Um, so the hash buff is 32 bytes. It's and we'll get into more weird details with this, but it's the hash, plain and simple hash of a transaction. It's 32 bytes, 256 bits. Uh, the transaction output number, uh, it's 32 byte, uh, little Indian integer, uh, script VI is a you know, variable size integer, then followed by the script, and the sequence number is, is an unsigned integer. Um, but this is where we start to notice being aware of the difference between two's complement and signed magnitude matters, because you'll see things like a negative one cast to an unsigned integer in Bitcoin Core, and what that means is it takes like the binary form of that number in two's complement, so that's why negative one is cast to all ones. So it's really in two's complement form. Um, so transaction output uh, is a little bit simpler, so it's the value that you're sending to that output, so you might send 500 Satoshis, it's not Bitcoins, it's Satoshis. Uh, so that's an unsigned 64-bit uh, little Indian number, uh, followed by the, the output script. So we've gotten this far. We've covered like all the stuff that you see in a transaction. So here is the structure of a transaction. It starts with a version byte, uh, which can be something different, I guess, but right now it's one. Um, then uh, basically the number of inputs, followed by the number of outputs, followed by in lock time, which is another thing that's, it's a number that's not usually used, but sometimes it is. Um, so it's just, uh, it's there. So that's it. Transactions, inputs, plus outputs, plus in lock time. That's basically it. Um, so here are some examples. So here is, this is just a, a transaction I pulled uh, from the blockchain, sort of at random. So here we have the hash and the ID. So the ID is actually the reverse of the hash, which is what you see when you look at most blockchain explorers, as well as like Bitcoin QT. Uh, because the hash is usually interpreted as a little Indian number, when programs display this number, they prefer to display it in big Indian, and so that's why they're always reversed. So it's something you have to be aware of. 
Uh, if you're building a transaction, I've made this mistake myself, I plug in the reversed version of the hash, and your transaction's invalid, and it takes you a while to figure out, oh, I reverse, I need to reverse this. Um, and so, there you go. So there's a, there's a random example of a transaction. So uh, we'll cover some of this later when I go through my code samples, we'll run actual code. But here's just an example of what happens when I parse a transaction. The font's really small, so you probably can't see it. So let's zoom in on the, the one and only input. So this is an actual transaction. We uh, parsed the input, and we can see it has uh, an input transaction buffer, uh, the, which number output it is from that transaction, and then the size of the script, and then the script, and then the sequence number. And if you look at the script, it's just pushing data to the stack. But, so it says like 71, so it's, whoops, it's pushing 71 bytes to the stack followed by 71 bytes. So it's pushing the signature and then the public key. So the first 71 bytes is the signature followed by 33 bytes because the public key in compressed form is 33 bytes. And then the one and only output, we have the value that it's sending. In this case, it's 3.3 million Satoshis, which is 0 0.003 Bitcoin, I think. Maybe it's 0 0.03. 0 0.03 Bitcoin, approximately. Um, and then the script. So this is this is a, one of the standard scripts, which is another thing we'll talk about in a little bit of detail later. But this is just what one of the standard scripts looks like. Opdo pop hash 160. Push the address. Op equal ver verify op check state. Um, yeah, so here we just show the, the input and the output scripts in this transaction. And then the thing to be aware of. When you actually execute the scripts, you run the input script and the output script of the previous transaction, of the input transaction. So when you actually run them, you have to go find the previous, you know, the input transaction, run its output script. So the, this is like what you grabbed, what the output script of that input transaction is, and here's, here's what it looks like. So how to script interpret, how to run a script interpreter. So uh, the stack, I'll just run through this and explain it, and I can show a plot uh, of what this looks like. So uh, the stack contains byte arrays. So it can contain like zero bytes, one byte, two bytes, three bytes. Um, you can push things to the stack, pop things from the stack. You can move them to the alt stack. There's no heap. There's no way to like, I don't know, have like a pointer. You can't do something like that in, uh, in, in, uh, in Bitcoin. Um, so it's pretty simple. Uh, it's just a stack. Um, the way you run this is uh, you sort of have a, your transaction available, and then you run the script SIG, which is the script in the input. This does some stuff to the stack. It leaves the stack. Then, assuming that, trend, that, that script doesn't return false, it then runs the script pub key, which is the script from the input transaction's output. And it starts with the same stack that you left after running the script sig. Uh, and again, if that doesn't return false, and it leaves something true on the stack, then your transaction has not been invalidated. Uh, and P2SH is slightly more complicated, which is if your transaction is of the form of P2SH, which is where the script sig has some extra data at the end, uh, and the output script is the right form, is a, is a P2SH output, then this thing is popped from the stack and then executed again, again leaving whatever was on the stack the same. So there are potentially three scripts that run, but they leave like the memory, the stack the same uh, when, you, when you run the next script. And just something to be aware of, if you ever program this or you know, use something like this, be aware that you need to be absolutely equivalent to the logic that Bitcoin Core uses in every detail, and if you're off by one minor detail, somebody can scan you. They can send you money and you think you've received it and you haven't, or they can uh, you know, send you money and you haven't received it, but you really have, you know, so just be aware of that. Anytime you're looking at this, it's very difficult to get the, the details right. Some people think it's next to impossible. I mean, how, many, how many languages has the script interpreter been validated on? Been validated on? So it's been written in quite a few languages at this point. All the major languages have a script interpreter written in them. However, what matters is that the miners run Bitcoin Core. As far as I'm aware, they all run Bitcoin Core. Bitcoin Core is written in C++, and it has weird other you know, dependencies like the database it uses. And there are things where if you, uh, if you encounter a database error, it throws an exception, and then it catches it, and then it says, okay, that transaction is invalid. 
So you have to like, not only do you program what's in Bitcoin Core, but you have to be aware of what your dependencies are. And that giant mesh of dependencies means there might be weird details in, in what constitutes a valid transaction that are really hard to figure out. So everybody runs Bitcoin Core if you're a miner, basically. Like you can, like, I wrote a script interpreter, I'll show you guys later, but I wouldn't use it, you know, for mine. For mine. Or, or if I'm running a company and I need to rely on whether I really have or really have not received transactions, I would just use Bitcoin Core. I would not use my own library. I would use my library for other reasons. It's cool, it's, it's educational. I, I use it for debugging purposes all the time. If I need to know why a transaction is invalid, I can run my own script interpreter on it. But for, for, you know, for dealing with money, uh, we haven't quite solved the problem of how to re-implement Bitcoin in a completely equivalent way. Question. So, yes? Stack. What's the purpose of stack here? Could you repeat the question? Yeah, what, so what's the purpose of the stack? So I'll explain right now. Perfect question. <laughs> we'll talk about it on this slide. So the, the stack is, it's the memory of Bitcoin when you run a script. So people were asking me last time, like, where is the stack? Like, it's just when you run a stack, it's in the memory of your computer. So each computer that bothers to run a script, the stack is stored on its computer. This, the stack is not something on the blockchain. Uh, it's just something that's on your computer. Um, so here's just a very common example of like the, one of the standard transactions. You're just paying money to an address, a normal Bitcoin address. Here's what it looks like. First we run the script sig. The script sig is pushing the signature to the stack and pushing the public key to the stack. So it just looks like random data, but the person who created it knew they were pushing on the public key and the script and the, and the signature. So that script is executed, and then you see the signature and the public key on the stack. So these are just pieces of data, signatures 73 or 72 bytes or whatever. Public key is probably 33 bytes. So there are two things on the stack. And as, as far as Bitcoin is concerned, they're just bytes, right? And it sort of depends on what operation you're running for it to know how to interpret what those bytes are. But we know it's a signature and a public key. So then, the first script is done being ex executed. That's the output of the script, uh, script um, pub key. <laughs> so the script sig is done being executed. So now we leave the stack the same, and then we start executing the, uh, the script pub key. And this is just what a normal script pub key looks like. It looks like the same thing I had a few slides back. Opdupe, ophash160, blah, blah, blah. So we first we run opdupe, so that duplicates the top item on the stack. So now we see two public keys at the top. Now we run ophash160, which hashes the top thing on the stack. Now we run uh, op equal verify to confirm that they are equal. That is, basically you're confirming that the person trying to spend the money has the correct public key that corresponds to that address. And finally you run op check sig, which uh, tries to confirm that the signature is correct. That is, that the signature corresponds to the public key and that it's a signature of that transaction. And assuming all this turns out fine, um, it returns true. It, it pops those final items off the stack, puts true on the stack, and then sort of is done executing. And then the higher level functions say, did the script interpreter pass? Yes. If it did not pass, then your transaction gets invalidated at wherever that step is. So if one of the things is false, you do op equal verify, and the two things are not equal, then it immediately invalidates whatever transaction you're, you're evaluating. So that's it. Does that answer your question about the stack? All right. Um, so how to validate a transaction? Uh, basically, you just run the script interpreter on all the inputs, plus some other miscellaneous things. So you make sure that the inputs are not duplicated, that you're not trying to spend the same money twice within the same transaction, uh, and you check the transactions can't be over the max block size, so there's a check for that. Uh, you make sure that the values aren't negative or greater than the maximum possible amount of money, which is max money, or 21 million. Um, and you make sure the inputs aren't null, you make sure they really refer to something, and then finally you run the script interpreter and make sure that the script interpreter returns true for all the scripts. So that's it, let me check the time real quick, because I have two, yeah, this is perfect timing. So I'll just, I'll pause here and take questions, yeah. So, uh, is validating a public, uh, public key part of this uh, process? How do uh, we know whether it is a... Sort of. So if, uh, so the question is, uh, is validating a public key part of this process? So it sort of is in two ways. Um, the first way is, like, let me go back and look at this, uh, the scripts. So when you hash the public key, well, the hash of the public key better turn out to be the address. Otherwise, it's wrong. 
So there is a bit of validation there that you need byte for byte equivalents of the public key. So there's that, you know, uh, uh, validation going on. Also, when you check the signature, you check that the signature is sort of assigned from the private key corresponding to that public key. And so you parse the public key as being a public key. And here's where it really matters that you do things the same as what Bitcoin does. Because when you read that public key, suppose it's invalid in some way. Do you return an error? What if Bitcoin Core doesn't return an error in that case and it treats it as being valid? Um, so the answer is, uh, if you plug in an invalid public key, uh, it's invalid and it'll invalidate your transaction. However, what defines what is a valid public key or not is sort of a tricky question that seems obvious at first, but it's really not obvious and you have to be absolutely certain that you're doing it in exactly the same way that Bitcoin Core does it. But, but yeah, it validates that the public key is or is not valid. And there's no operation that does that, but like if it's invalid and it's trying to read it in as a public key, it's like, oh, it's invalid, return false. Yes? So does it create a separate stack for each transaction? So the question is, uh, does it create a, a separate stack for each transaction? The answer is yes. So when you validate a transaction, you start anew with a new stack. So if you're validating 100 transactions in parallel, you can create 100 different stacks that have nothing to do with each other. So the stack is just for that transaction. Sure, so op dupe, uh, dupe is short for duplicate, so it just means to duplicate the top item of the stack. So as we see here in op dupe, so we run op dupe, we start with one public key, now we have two public keys. It took the top item on the stack, which was the public key, and just added the same value to the top of the stack again. So you duplicate the top value. And you do that because you want to now compare uh, uh, the hash of that public key to the address and make sure they're the same. So, uh, yeah. Alright. Other questions? How many can it handle at a time, right? Like, how many stacks can go on? As many as your computer. So the question is, how many stacks can you handle at a time? It depends on your computer. So I, I'm not sure what Bitcoin Core does. Um, it probably just runs them in sequence. That is, let's suppose you get a new block which has a bunch of transactions in it. You want to make sure that they're valid. It probably just runs it in sequence, like that is it validates transaction one, now validates transaction two, just because if you're a programmer it's easier to do it that way. I doubt it does it in parallel, however, I don't see any reason why you couldn't do that in completely parallel. If you have, you know, a uh, thousand transactions in a block, and you have a thousand computers, you could validate all thousand transactions at the same time. Yes. Uh, how is alt stack used in this case? The alt stack. Alt stack. Oh, the alt stack. Uh, so the alt stack is not normally used, so it's not used in this example. So there just is an alt stack available. So that's another thing, like I had to figure out where to draw the line when I'm giving this talk. Man, there are a whole bunch of operations that I'm not even covering. So like, you can do complicated scripts, um, but you know, not everything's considered standard. But in a nutshell, like, there's, there's a lot you can do. So normally you don't do that, but if for some reason you want to do a smart contract or whatever, and you want to use the alt stack for whatever reason, there is an alt stack available, and you can move things to the alt stack. I guess it's a way of saving data, like if you need to operate on the main stack, you push something in the alt stack, save it there, do stuff on the main stack, you're done, then you move it back to the alt stack. That's probably what you Yes? Um, if I skip all this validation and say I submit a transaction that just turns true, does that mean like uh, an invalid signature would be considered a valid transaction? Yeah, so, you're asking uh, what happens if I, if you skip all this stuff, you just have like a, a script that says return to. Yeah. It's totally possible. So you can do something like, imagine your output script literally just returns true. Um, anybody can spin that output is what happens. So anybody can then take, create a new transaction with that output as an input, put nothing in the script, and just rely on your return true to return true. That way that input is valid, and so you could, anybody could spend that money. I, I, I bet in that case somebody's watching the network waiting for somebody to do something like that, and they'll immediately spend your money if, if you do that. So, yeah. Yes? What about newly minted coins? Does it go through the stack? Um... Yeah, so newly minted coins. There is a validation performed on, so it's called the Coinbase transaction in a, in a block. Um, there is validation, so it doesn't run, so Coinbase transactions have an input, but the input is not executed. So there's no validation done. But there are other validations done, like the size of the input has to be a certain value. 
but there's nothing nothing that gets executed in the input script. So it's sort of she's not not executed in that case. So do all the nodes take care of validating the newly minted coins? Um, do all nodes take care of validating newly minted coins? If you want to, like a, a, by definition, a full node does that. If you're running a full node, that is, if you run like Bitcoin Core, which is a full node, it validates, you know, all the transactions and all the blocks. Um, and if anything at any point is invalid, it will reject that block. So that is a full node. All miners do this because they want to make sure they're really mining on the latest block. So they definitely want to validate that the block they just received is valid. Uh, otherwise, they won't get their mining reward. So miners do this. Everybody, you know, people people like supporting the network by running a full node. Uh, however, if you're using one of the normal wallets, you're probably not doing this. You know, if you're if you if you're using Coinbase, you're not doing this. If you're using BitGo, you're you're not doing this. Um, so you have to sort of go out of your way to run a full node. But yeah, full nodes validate uh, transactions. Can you please clarify that? The difference between Coinbase, the company, and you're talking about Lee Coinbase. And oh, sure, that's a great point. It's something I don't even think about when I'm. So Coinbase, there's a company called Coinbase. There's also a Coinbase transaction. Coinbase, the company, liked the name Coinbase, and they took it from an actual Bitcoin thing. So a Coinbase transaction is like the mining reward transaction. So when you mine a new block, you get free Bitcoins, and that's just called the Coinbase transaction, and that's what the company Coinbase is named after. But they are definitely completely different things. <laughs> and so, when miners are generating blocks, they have to generate this Coinbase transaction to one of their. Yes. yes. So, when we, the question is, when miners generate a block, they have to generate this Coinbase transaction. Yes. So, what they do is they create a Coinbase transaction that has an output that is sending my 25 bitcoins to this address. And they don't have to do that. I mean, I, I think I'm not sure what happens if you don't put a Coinbase transaction in the, in the block. I don't know if that would be valid or not, but no one would ever not put it in there. Because, you, know. you talked about, uh, I think it was DER signatures at the beginning, mm -hmm. um, and kind of inefficient. How, how come the core devs haven't looked at uh, fixing that? Is it because of you know, backwards compatibility? Or? Yeah, so the question is, why are we using this crappy signature format? Why don't we just fix it? Uh, the answer is absolutely backwards compatibility. So like, you can't start invalidating signatures that were previously valid, for one. If you in, decide you want to change the format of a signature, and in the future you're going to regard those as being invalid, then you're changing the protocol. And anybody who's running the old software is going to think they're valid, and you're going to think they're invalid, so you're going to go off on a fork. So that would be, you would be changing the Bitcoin, you're, yeah, 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 I guess it would be a hard fork. Yeah, it would definitely be a hard fork if, if you started plugging in like compact signatures, the old, uh, nodes would think that's invalid. So it would be a hard floor. So that's the reason. We're just sort of stuck with it. There are a number of weird issues like that that basically everyone would want to change this. We'd have unanimous consensus that we'd want to change this. But it's really hard to convince everyone like this is actually worth it and safe enough that we all are literally going to change the protocol and risk a hard floor um, in order to just fix this sort of minor irritating issue. So in reality, like we just, we just deal with these irritating issues. Yes. Uh, what is the input of Coinbase transaction? Uh, it's it's nothing. So it's a null input. So it, it, I think it's like all. I think the it refers to a transaction that's all zeros. So like you input the previous transaction, it's null. It's zeros. So there's an input there, but it's it's like it doesn't refer to an actual input. You know, transaction. It's, it's zeros, and then like the uh, the v out portion is another one of these cases where it's actually. The, it's minus one cast to an unsigned integer, so the V out is all Fs, and then the uh, transaction or the transaction hash is, is all zero. So it's it's what's considered a null input. There's an input there, but it's null. Okay, the sequence yes. number used? Is the sequence number used? So, yeah, so sequence number is I'm I'm not sure if anybody's really using this in practice. Like I I think you can I think payment channels rely on sequence number, although I'm not sure if anybody's really using this in production anywhere. Sequence numbers were originally conceived of, I think, by Satoshi to let you sort of build a transaction, broadcast it to the network, but it starts out being invalidated, and it just sort of hangs there in memory, and then you update the transaction with a new sequence number. I think that was the idea of it. Um, and so the idea would be that higher sequence numbers are uh, replace the earlier transaction, 
But there's no way to like guarantee that that happens, and so like it, it's it's not really used in practice. I'm, I'm not actually aware of anybody. I, if anybody knows, correct me if I'm wrong. But I'm not aware of anybody that's using a sequence number for anything in production today. And can you go through the details of uh, the object Yeah. Um, so go through the details of the object. So the signature is using the predicate, right? If you're using predicate to sign something, what is the sign? Well, object check sig does not use the private key, but when you're building the transaction... Right, I mean, the signature is actually by mm -hmm. the signature by the private key. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. What's that something? It's of the transaction. So that's another great question that I sort of just immediately skipped over just because it's more details. But So when you sign a transaction, what does this mean? Well, in ECDSA, there is an operation for producing a signature, um, and you take in a number. And I think it works on arbitrarily large numbers, but you would never do this for computational reasons. You plug in a 32-byte number. So you take the hash of the transaction, um, and you sign the hash of the transaction. Now, this is where it starts getting, getting really tricky, because a transaction contains your signature. So how do you sign something that has your signature in it? Well, the way this works in Bitcoin is you have to blink the inputs, and you blink them in a very specific way that must be exactly you know, correct. Um, so you blank the inputs. Then there are multiple ways to sign a transaction. So there's SIGHash all, SIGHash single, SIGHash none, and then SIGHash anyone can pay, which are uh, uh, different ways to either blank or not blank certain inputs or outputs. So the answer is complicated. <laughs> I don't have any plots to, to show you about those things, but there's basically you sign the hash of a transaction and then if you really want to do this though, like I, so I wrote uh, you know, a sig hash function is what I call that signature hash. Um, it probably took, I would say at least a week, maybe two weeks, if I, I don't quite remember, but it takes a while because to get all the edge cases absolutely correct and be able to do sig hash all, sig hash none, sig hash anyone can pay, it's, it's not like trivial, like it's really hard. So it took me a while to, to figure out what all the edge cases are and actually implement. So it's, it's unfortunate. I could probably do a whole talk just on any unit signature. It's kind of complicated. I mean, the PKI is, is you, I mean, the whole idea of PKI is private key and public key, and the fact that if you encrypt something with private key, you know, decrypt it with public key, and vice versa, right? So I'm assuming the, the point of having the sig and the public key is so that you can, if, because signature is based on private key, and then you can decrypt it with the public key, and then you want to verify if something is correct. But I don't know what something is, because I'm not seeing something on the stack. Okay, so That's first of all, there's I, I would not use the terminology you're using. So the, the public key cryptography used in Bitcoin has nothing to do with encryption or decryption. Okay. It's about signing and verifying. Okay. So there are two different uses of public key cryptography. One is sort of what it was invented for originally, which is being able to encrypt data with a public key, and then only the person with the private key can decrypt it. That's not what Bitcoin does. Encryption does not occur in the Bitcoin protocol. It's purely about signing and verifying, which is a distinct use of really similar math, but not equivalent. So what you do is you sign a transaction. You don't encrypt it, right? Then you verify a transaction. You don't decrypt it. So does that help clarify your question? Well, how does the math work? That's what I'm curious. How does the what work? The map. How does the map work? I want to see how that happens. Okay, well, so I, I can describe it in words. Um, so the Mac, you're saying, how does the Mac work? The, uh, you know, how do you authenticate this? So you, um, maybe I can just show you the, I can show you my code of. So what's the status of full node? It, it, I, I thought it was alpha. It's on. Um, so here's, I'll show you. So when you sign a transaction, there's no point in me zooming in on this because like it would take a while to parse what this is actually saying. But this is the super complicated uh, compute the hash of a signature function, what I call sig hash. So it's just a bunch of lines <laughs> that has to be done exactly correctly depending on what way you're hashing the transaction, whatever. So if you're signing it, you produce this hash, you sign the hash, you produce a signature that then goes in, in the transaction. When you verify it, you also have to hash the transaction again, and then verify that the signature and the public key are the signature of that hash. 
So does that answer uh, your question? I think I kind of did it. I need to kind of go over it in my mind. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I understand you can uh, stick up to 40 bytes in a transaction with off return, but what's stopping me from, say, putting a couple hundred bytes of arbitrary data in a script that doesn't really do anything? Yeah. Bytes. So the question is, so we, we know you can put 40 bytes of data in an off-return output. Uh, what's stopping you from putting more data uh, in there? And the answer is, uh, it depends. Um, so there are two different sort of network rules. Uh, you can put more data in there, and it's considered a valid transaction. However, there's a notion of what is a standard transaction. And if you try to create a non-standard transaction, then it won't be relayed, and you'll have problems getting it into a block. So if you try to do something weird, like encode a whole bunch of just random data in a transaction, first of all, there are limits, like there's a 500-byte limit on the size of scripts. So like you can't breach that limit or it's invalid. Um, but even if it's not over that limit, um, if it's non-standard, you either have to be a miner or you gotta send it directly to a miner that's willing to mine that transaction. So it's, they're literally different types. I'll cover this a little bit more detail in the next section, um, but, uh, Basically, you can do that, but it's easier said than done. And there are still validation rules, like it can't be over 500 bytes anyway. Plus, you're just going to annoy everyone. How many standard way. types are there at this point? Uh, there standard are four scripts. standard <coughs> scripts, or maybe it's five. It's PubKey, uh, uh, PubKey Hash, um, uh, Multisig, Page Script Hash, and then also op return. So I guess there are five. Is there any, um, if you were to say there was one thing that was the most common thing somebody did that wasn't one of the, the base five, what would it be, anything? I'm not aware of anything. I'm not aware of anything that people do. So the question is, what is like the most popular smart contract? Is sort of, I don't know, there's one way I would, I would add, uh, phrase your question. What is, like, what do people do besides the normal things of sending Bitcoin around? I'm not aware of any uses besides the normal ones today. So uh, I'm sure people have experimented with stuff, but nothing's widely used. So again, for you know, at this point, learning, uh, you know, to create new code for the interpreter is not that useful because you'd really have to have a complete system and mining and all that kind of stuff to do. So creating a new program in in um, the script language isn't really that useful. Yeah, so you're at, so it's not that useful to create a new program in Bitcoin script. It's true today that uh, if you try to create elaborate scripts, uh, it's not going to be very useful. Um, so there are, there are all sorts of reasons for it. So the Bitcoin scripting language is deliberately limited. So it's not as for people who like know about Ethereum and stuff. Ethereum is, is basically like a Turing complete Bitcoin. At least that's one of the primary reasons why it's created. Um, Bitcoin is not Turing complete. You can't program just anything in it. So it's really, really limited. Um, so that's one reason why you can't do advanced things with the Bitcoin scripting language. Another reason is, since Bitcoin was sort of released in early 2009, there have been quite a lot of attacks on Bitcoin. Nothing, of course, has destroyed Bitcoin, but there have been attacks on it, primarily DOS attacks, where people do something weird that takes people's, you know, computers down or something. Um, so people are really worried about uh, people finding a weird script that does something unexpected to everybody's computer. So for right now, like uh, that's why there are five standard transaction types and everything else isn't relayed. We're like defending against the unknowns of what happens when you start doing advanced scripts. So that's one barrier, it's sort of social. Like we could just change the network rules and so long as everyone adopted, which is the network rules are different than the core protocol, we can, we can change it and you don't have to worry about hard forks. But you still have to get people to run your new, you know, so multisig was the most recently one approved socially, in a sense? Multisig itself is built into the Bitcoin protocol. It's always been there. Um, Pay2ScriptHash is what's new. So Pay2ScriptHash lets you, it's sort of what it sounds like, I mean, if you parse what, what the words are saying. Rather than have an output script and then an input script, you have an output script that says I'm paying to another script. Then in the input script, you have normal stuff. And then you also have this extra data, which is called the redeem script which uh, is also executed. So a page script hash means I've created a custom script that I want to be executed. Here's the hash of it. Make sure that whoever pays or whoever like, you know, sends money from this output 
has the correct script and executes it. So that's called PHP script hash, and that's new. Uh, that was not in the original protocol, and that was a soft fork of Bitcoin. So people figured out how to add this neat new feature in a totally soft fork way. That is, people who understand PHP script hash are not treated as being invalid by the old software. So that, that's, a, that's a new feature. If you can figure out how to add new soft fork features to Bitcoin, and everybody likes it, it's totally possible to add it in. So that's, that's PHP script hash. Good questions? I'm going to give a whole other talk. You know, I don't know, an hour or something. You'll have your slides, right? Yes, I posted it on Twitter, and I can post it on the Slack channel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll do that. Cool. All right. Well, thank you. I guess we'll let's just resume. I don't know. Like, is it? Yeah. Okay. So we'll pause for a little while.